Thank you, members. The sitting is resumed. Uh, it's time for questions to the Minister for the Environment, uh, Agriculture, the Environment and Rural Affairs. Uh, before I call the first member, I can advise members that question number 13 has been withdrawn. I call Sinead Ennis. Ms Ennis. Gurham, I get uh, question one, please. Thank you. It's imperative that we build an evidence base and ensure government policy uh, making has climate and environment at its core, and that future policies and strategies can demonstrably deliver the outcomes people expect. We need to fully understand the unique characteristics on the makeup of Northern Ireland emissions and determine what is our equitable contribution to net zero. That is why I have written to the independent expert UK Climate Change Committee for advice on what would be our equitable contribution to the UK's net zero emissions target to ensure our emissions reduction targets are credible and evidence-based. Unfortunately, the CCC are not in a position to respond to my request until after they have provided advice on the UK's sixth carbon budget, which will be published in December 2020. So in the interim, my officials have commenced work on scoping the options the introduction of a Northern Ireland Climate Change Bill. And I will consider these options along with the advice provided from CCC and will present my findings to the Northern Ireland Executive to agree a way forward. Ms Ennis. And I take note of the Minister's response and I, and I thank him for, for the, the actions he's outlined uh, thus far. But given that you yourself, Minister, has acknowledged um, that there is a climate crisis and there is a need to follow the latest climate um, change scientific advice, and given that we are the only place in these islands without um, a climate change act, how can you, Minister, justify uh, your, your heel dragging on this issue and your reluctance to bring forward um, a climate change act? I can assure you that there is no heel dragging taking place within my department, and we are working on actions as opposed to acts. Um, actions actually deliver things. Acts put a form of words in place. Um, so action speaks louder than words always. Ms. Bradley. Deputy Speaker, Minister, with all respect, you haven't really given an answer to the question. I don't think you have to wait for a CCC report dated December 2020 to gather evidence that a climate bill, climate change bill, is required today? Well, in, in terms of producing a, a bill, um, one will want to have the best and the most credible evidence that is available to them. So we are doing courses of work in conjunction with gathering that evidence. The bill will not be what delivers real and significant change. It will be the actions that flow from it, or indeed the actions that we can do um, prior to developing an e-bill. So what is important is actually our actions as opposed to the legislation. And I can assure you that my department is working extensively on what actions it can do um, to reduce the carbon footprint uh, that we have here in Northern Ireland and make a significant contribution uh, to ensuring that Northern Ireland's, uh, uh, Northern Ireland's effort in terms of reaching net zero uh, will be something which is significant. Mr. John Blair. Speaker, and can I acknowledge the answers given by the Minister and the work done by the Department and others indeed to, to achieve net zero? But to, to frame this uh, specifically in relation to the original question, can I ask, um, is there an exact date or is there even a general timeline? within the Department or the Minister's Office uh, on when a Climate Change Act might become a reality? No, there is not an exact date because we are we're working towards gathering the appropriate information. Uh, we have uh, been in correspondence with the Climate Change Committee. Uh, these are the people who have, would have the most expertise and, and uh, the best quality of information um, to work off. And uh, we will continue to, to work very closely uh, with them to identify um, what the issues are, what the contribution um, that will be expected of us, and how best um, we can achieve that at the best value for money, um, most expeditiously. Mrs. Martina Anderson. Good, the last three can call in a question number two. 
I have really sought assurance from UKG that they will meet any associated costs placed on Northern Ireland business as a result of the implementation of the protocol, including as a result of the sanitary and phytosanitary checks. I will continue to press them on this matter. Uh, Minister, thank you for that answer. Very brief, I suppose. As you would know, farmers and rural businesses um, will face a loss of millions of European funding uh, post-Brexit. So, are you telling me that there isn't an estimated cost on the number of businesses that will going to be made unviable as a consequence of the implications in the implementation of this disastrous uh, Brexit? And um, just to uh, businesses, have they been made aware of what they are facing, particularly with checks? Well, the member is making an assumption that the, the funding that um, previously came from Europe is not going to be replaced, and that's not something that we have accepted. Um, her uh, party may, may accept that. It's something that um, I will be fighting, um, that we actually have that funding available, and that we will distribute that funding. And uh, given that the UK was a net contributor to the European Union, and therefore uh, we were only getting back around 50 per cent of what was being paid into the European Union. It is entirely reasonable that you know, I and, and ministerial colleagues make the case uh, that that funding should be fully replaced, and that is uh, the case that we will be making. Mr. Jim Allister. Um, thank you. No later than last night, the minister's political party affirmed uh, opposition to Northern Ireland's economic place in the UK being compromised by the protocol and proclaimed that new customs infrastructure in Northern Ireland was an immovable foundational opposition to that was an immovable foundational pillar. Why then is the minister continuing to ready to provide infrastructure at our ports in Northern Ireland to create an Irish sea border? Um, I think the member will find that the minister has opposed infrastructure at the RIC ports and, and, and always has, uh, as has his colleagues at Westminster, who have voted consistently um, against any such proposals. Um, we have um, resisted such proposals here in Northern Ireland, and this is an imposition that has been put upon us, uh, the protocol. Uh, this is not something which was put, out, put through this assembly. We thought that that would be the case, and that was refused. Uh, so we will have to wait and see what the, the, the government does next, because we're having legislation going through this week, and certainly uh, we, don't, we are not in a position um, at this point um, to actually even know what is required at ports, because nothing has been agreed between either the European Union um, or the UK in terms of these matters. Uh, and that is the flux that we find ourselves in. Mr. Steve Aiken. Indeed, and I thank the Minister for his reply so far. Just ask the Minister if there is any details of the goods and products that can avail of the Free Trader Support Service, and could he publish a regular updated list and information? Again, all of these things um, are issues which, which are continually uh, being negotiated. And I think that we are in the eighth negotiation that has taken place. Uh, so, therefore, we do not have that clarity that the member I respect would like and that all of us would like. Um, consequently, uh, we will continue to lobby. We will continue to make a case that uh, Northern Ireland has unfettered access, uh, both NI to GB and indeed GB to NI, uh, because, after all, 53 per cent of our goods um, goes from Northern Ireland to Great Britain, and 65 per cent of the goods imported to Northern Ireland comes from Great Britain. So it is entirely illogical to create barriers um, and to create any uh, tariffs or fetters uh, between those markets, um, those internal markets. Uh, so let us see what comes out of the Internal Market Bill. I think it is fundamentally important that Northern Ireland's place is appropriately recognised um, within the United Kingdom in that respect, and that we are not treated differently um, from other places. Mr. Pat Catney. Question number three, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. 
My department is committed to continued protection and improvement of the environment as we move into this new decade. I agree that initiatives are required to address climate change and the promotion of natural habitats. And I have already initiated a number of measures to address these matters. In March, I announced the Forest for the Futures programme, which will involve the planting of 18 million trees over the next 10 years. I also recently outlined in the Assembly my concept to transform and grow the Northern Ireland economy whilst protecting our natural assets and reducing our carbon emissions through use of a green growth approach. And I have committed resources within my department to progress this approach. A delivery framework will be delivered, which will consist of a range of programmes which together will contribute to the key environmental and climate change targets and commitments in the programme for government. A new decade, new approach by transforming to a greener, low-carbon economy. Some, like forests for our future, are already in motion. We will also seek to continue to deliver measures to conserve and restore our natural habitats, such as those delivered through the Department's Environmental Fund. And I look forward to obtaining the support from Executive colleagues to enable further implementation of these measures. Mr. Cantley. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Another area that we can use to promote the restoration of natural habitats is through sustainable farming practices. I know companies like Jordan's have good initiatives. What is the Minister doing to promote sustainable farming practices to help restore our natural habitats? Well, we're working very closely with the farming community uh, in identifying how we can. Um, deliver uh, carbon neutral farming. And th that is something which is entirely achievable because farming actually, uh, farming practice in Northern Ireland, um, a lot of it is done in a very environmentally friendly way already. Um, so there is a considerable amount of carbon sequestration here in Northern Ireland, which does not take place in many parts of the continent. Um, so where you have feedlots, etc., um, you know, and ground is being ploughed continuously and machinery is cutting and, and drawing all of that material in. Um, that is, is not a, as an environmentally mm -hmm. friendly way of, of farming as would be the case in Northern Ireland where we have animals outdoors in our green fields. So we need to identify what we're doing in terms of carbon sequestration and identify what we can do to reduce the amount of nutrients that go into our soil, the amount of uh, ammonia that goes into our atmosphere uh, and reduce the amounts of, of greenhouse gases that go into our atmosphere. And there is a lot that we can do. There is, there is low-hanging fruit there, um, which we want to identify very quickly. There will be things that will be a little more tricky. Uh, but nonetheless, I think that we can, working um, together, overcome those issues. Paul Given. Speaker, can I commend the Minister in the work that he is doing in uh, driving forward uh, this agenda, uh, and in particular the forestation plans that he has announced? Uh, in, in terms of the schemes and initiatives that his department are considering, will the Minister undertake uh, to look at what uh, potential there is to capitalise on the many outdoor opportunities that exist uh, with organisations uh, that need capital support uh, to bring those into a realisation? Uh, in light of uh, the past number of months, increased uh, members of the public have enjoyed the outdoors, but there needs to be capital schemes put in place so that they can be developed and organisations supported. As someone who had the privilege of being brought up in the countryside, um, I'm delighted to see um, people who live in, in cities and towns having the opportunity um, to come out to the countryside and enjoy it. And uh, as a body, through, through our forest service, um, we have been working with local councils to develop and enhance uh, a lot of our forest parks. And I know that there is a lot of organisations uh, which are urban-based and will bring young people um, who have lived in urban areas into rural settings, into forest settings, um, and they get a better appreciation um, of our countryside. We get a better appreciation of, of habitats and of the good that it does. And uh, I think that it is a, a, an important thing that we do undertake um, to look at that and see how we can uh, encourage and support those organisations uh, which are bringing um, young people uh, into rural settings. Mrs Rosemary Barton. Minister, thank you very much for your answer so far.
Minister, do you accept that agricultural development has significantly been restricted in recent years, particularly in County Fermanagh, due to policy implementation of the Shared Environmental Services and the Northern Ireland Environment Agency? And have these directives been based on Northern Ireland, UK or EU legislation? I, I, I do accept that that's the case, Mrs. Barton, and, and it is EU policy. So let, let's, let's put it out there. Um, EU policy has restricted um, a lot of farm development over the course of the last number of years. It has restricted growth in the economy. Uh, it has restricted job growth. So let's just, let's just be very frank about it. Um, however, uh, these are, are laws which we will continue to live with for, for, for some time, and consequently, it is important um, that we seek to uh, mitigate uh, where we can. And that is why I'm looking at how we can um, reduce uh, a lot of the emissions uh, that come from farms and manage uh, a lot of the nutrients in a better way, uh, so that we can develop a win-win situation. Um, where we won't restrict uh, the growth that needs to happen in agriculture, otherwise it will die, um, whilst at the same time we do not do environmental damage. And that is something which is achievable. It will require investment and it will require commitment. Um, you will get, get both of those th things from me, and I will take those issues uh, to the executive at an appropriate point uh, to drive forward. Claire Bailey. The Minister will be aware from his own departmental figures that in most of the areas of special conservation in Northern Ireland, we have um, unacceptable um, breaches of ammonia levels. Um, so could the Minister give, in some cases in those areas, up to over 300 per cent in each area by your own figures? So could you let us know some detail about what the Minister will do to address this critical issue? Well, in the past, we have had SES, for example, recommend and refusal to applications where people were demolishing older buildings to replace them with newer buildings, which would have actually reduced the ammonia, but they were still sending forward uh, recommendations for refusals. And that, that is something which is entirely unacceptable and illogical. So a lot of the newer developments, for, particularly for pigs and poultry, um, can be done a, in a way which will re reduce the, the, the ammonia levels that are being produced. So we need to be actually rational as to how we do this. And in doing so, we can ensure that we can protect the environment because that is something which is critically important that we do. Um, but at the same time, we can allow people who want to invest and grow their farm, and consequently create jobs and produce precious food to be put on people's tables right across uh, this country and beyond, um, we can allow both to happen simultaneously. And that's, that, that, that should be all of our goals in this House, not just mine. Mr. William Irwin. Number four, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. A number of people at Transwick Country Foods, Ballymena, have recently tested positive for coronavirus. During the week of the 17th of August, the decision was made by the Public Health Agency to declare all workers on site to be close contacts. This required all workers to undergo um, coronavirus testing and then self-isolate at home for either 10 or 14 days, depending on test results. The ultimate decision on the actions required to manage this COVID-19 incident in Cranswick and the wider Ballymena community lies within the remit of the Chief Medical Officer and Minister for Health. DEAR has and will continue to facilitate communication between all parties involved and provide expert advice on our areas of competence as required. The last day of processing was on Thursday, the 20th of August, and the site as a whole was closed on Saturday, the 22nd of August. On Friday, the 28th of August, the site visit was carried out by the PHA, HSE, and DERA officials, and all bodies were content with measures in place to protect the health and safety of staff. The factory reopened on Friday, the 4th of September, and the food business operator is planning measures to deal with the backlog of pigs which is built up on farms. Mr. Arvin. Can I thank the Minister for his response and can I thank the Minister also for his endeavours 
in relation to this issue. Uh, he did mention the backlog of pigs. I'm fully aware and have constituents that have contacted me in relation to this. Uh, has the Minister had any discussions with processors in relation to trying to clear up this backlog? We're speaking on a daily basis uh, with Cranswick, the Public Health Agency, uh, for uh, at least a week uh, in terms of managing the, 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 the closure and indeed uh, the reopening once again. Uh, I welcome the fact that, that Cranswick have committed to doing this um, and they are working closely with the farming community. We will offer um, all the support that we can to ensure uh, that Cranswick um, can. Uh, uh, carry out their processing, and we will also seek to assist them in getting the, the, the approval to go back into the Chinese market, which is critical uh, in terms of uh, ensuring that the price uh, rises again uh, to where it was uh, before this happened. On the issue of pork processing plants, the Minister, I'm sure, will be aware of the huge uh, fire that happened in my constituency last evening um, in Kilkeel, where up to 2,000 pigs were unfortunately um, destroyed in that fire. Can the Minister confirm whether his department has been in contact with the farmer in question to see what supports uh, his department can offer? I think we did veer from the question there a bit, but all politics is local, and if the Minister wants to answer it, I'm sure the Middlestar Mail will be interested in his response. Minister? Yeah, absolutely. I, I have asked the Veterinary Service um, to, to be in contact with the owner. Um, it's an absolutely awful thing to have happened, and uh, it just, I, I would hope that um, they will be able uh, to ensure that, in terms of animal welfare and all of that there, that they can give uh, quality of advice and support um, to the individual. Ms. Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, um, Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, um, just in, in relation to the safety and well-being of the employees of these meat processing plants, can you confirm whether you are going to move towards more regular testing at this plant and, and others, given the prevalence of um, the virus um, being spread in these facilities? I think we need to be very careful. Um, first of all, I'll say that Cranswick as a company have behaved very responsibly um, throughout um, um, the, the COVID period, um, have installed uh, mechanisms and measures to avoid the spread of COVID. And it, it is fairly evident that a lot of the COVID um, that appeared in the plant um, came inwards as opposed to outwards. So a lot of it came from the community into the plant, just as it came into Antrim and Newton Abbey police stations, and just as it came into Craig Alvin Hospital. So people do need to take responsibility for themselves um, outside of their places of work. Whenever they're actually in the place of work, uh, the PPP, PPE equipment um, uh, is there. The, the, the perspex separation is there. A lot of work has been done to ensure separation takes place in the canteens as people enter work, as people leave work. So there has been a massive amount of work done by food companies. And it is incredibly important that given that agri-food supports around 10% of our employees, um, that we support our processing plants, because these people are providing jobs. Many of the people who work in them um, come from outside of Northern Ireland, and we need to support those people as well. Um, but there are major challenges there, uh, I would say, I commend the work of Cranswick, and I trust that very soon they will return uh, to the Chinese market as well, and that they will get back to full normality in, in that plant as early as possible. Mr. Patsy McLean. Mr. President, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers up until now. <clears throat> Could I ask the Minister to give uh, some idea or to expand on the level of collaboration that exists between his department, the likes of HSC and the Public Health Agency, around matters such as this in the interest of protection of both customers and uh, staff alike? Um, our veterinary science division and uh, our veterinary science uh, in particular uh, provided massive support to the Public Health Agency. So in terms of advising on, on PPE and, 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 and the, the perspects and all of the separation that should take place, uh, they played a leading role in all of the meat, meat plants uh, across Northern Ireland. Uh, they supported the meat plants in terms of their expertise, um, beyond their veterinary uh, expertise. 
Um, and I think that if you speak to any of the, 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 the meat companies, uh, they will indicate to you uh, that the support that they've got from uh, the veterinary division uh, within DERA has been massive, and I commend them for it. Mr. Allen Chambers. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, uh, would the Minister be in a position today to detail the number of pigs that would have been processed through this plant during the time it was closed? And if there is evidence of how many of these pigs remain on farm and how many have been processed through other plants? Thank you. Well, there's 12,000 a week go through Cranswick. Uh, so uh, uh, it closed two, two weeks ago. It, it opened on Friday. Um, and there were some 2,000 went through on Friday. Uh, in the meantime, uh, there's two other um, key plants in, in Northern Ireland, one in Cookstown and uh, Grants in Lottenderry. And they were hoping to be able to pick up around 4,000 per week, uh, which left a backlog of, of um, roughly 8,000 each week. That's significant. Uh, and I had many farmers who contacted me directly uh, to indicate the problems that they faced in that young pigs were being born, they would normally move into uh, uh, an area, the weaners move into another area, the fattening pigs move into another area, uh, and that was being backlogged and that was causing considerable problems on those farms. Mr Trevor Clark. Five. In my written statement to the Assembly on the 30th of June, I outlined the allocation of £21.4 million of the £25 million support package to support farmers and growers the dairy, beef, sheep, potato and ornamental horticulture sectors that have been hardest hit financially as a direct result of the COVID-19 pandemic. I also stated that I wanted to be prudent with the funding as we cannot rule out the possibility of further market disturbance as a result of this pandemic and the need for additional support to farmers and growers. For that reason, I have retained a budget of £7.2 million based on the residual funding of £3.6 million uh, from the 25 million agreed by the executive, and 3.6 million that was reprioritised from within my own department. This would allow me to address additional issues and challenges COVID-19 may present in the weeks ahead. My officials and I are monitoring the situation and continue to consult with industry stakeholders to assess the impact of COVID-19 across all sectors. Should any future support schemes be required, their development would require a robust business case and available budget and following the same design principles as the current schemes. These include ensuring good governance, that support is for evidence-based losses caused by market disturbance, is targeted those impacted most financially, and avoids unnecessary bureaucracy and complies with legal requirements, including state aid rules. Mr. Clark. Can I thank the Minister for that question? And when I tabled my question, I was unaware of the scheme that was coming forward. And can I congratulate the Minister for the very full package that we actually have seen now since announced. But in looking at that, Minister, there's probably one area that maybe has missed out, and that's probably the broiler breeders. Will you give any consideration to them going forward, given that you've captured most of the other ones in that very uh, generous scheme that you have announced? I thank the member for the question. My department has been meeting with industry stakeholders, and we are aware that COVID-19 has had a significant impact on the hatching egg producers. So many of these eggs would have been sold to the Middle East, for example, to the Far East. Um, this was something uh, where we, um, the, the standard of, of Northern Ireland uh, chicken uh, is rated right across the world, and therefore the demand for the hatching eggs is something which is uh, sought uh, by many people. However, those markets have dried up as a consequence of COVID-19. And uh, state aid rules prevent me from um, supporting the sector previously because we were, weren't looking at losses that had happened. We were looking at losses that were projected. Um, but my officials are continuing to monitor the impact in the sector. And um, those losses are becoming more evident now. And therefore, it is something that um, I think in future, um, certainly within this financial year, uh, we will be able to give that um, significant consideration. We have about 30 seconds, so a quick question and a yes and no answer. Uh, just for quickly, quickly, um, the, no doubt the Minister has been lobbied by the wheel industry. Would he be minded to look at um, supporting those farmers affected by the collapse of the wheel industry, the wheel industry in the next uh, round or some of the money from the money he's retained? Certainly had the conversation. Um, it's very complex in terms of, of, of providing support to that sector. Um, the wool actually accounts for a very small proportion 
um, of, of uh, the, the, the profitability in, in the sheep sector. And, and the lamb prices have been remarkably good. I reserved this £7 million expecting a double dip for lamb and beef, um, but it, they have been remarkably good over the summer. Thank you, Minister. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions. And I call Mr Patsy McGloom. Thanks very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I am um, sure the Minister will acknowledge that I have written to him several times and had conversations with him on a number of occasions about support for the fishing industry in Loch Ney. Um, can the Minister give an indication if such support will be forthcoming for the fishing industry on Loch Ney, please? Well, in terms of uh, the, the Loch Ney eel fishery, um, it is something that we recognise um, has been affected, and we would be looking to provide um, some support for that sector. So, we are looking at, at, at around two, at £250,000 scheme support for inland fishermen um, who, who uh, fish in Loch Ney um, for the eel and scale fisheries, and, and that is a course of work that, hasn't, that is not complete, um, but that is certainly the, the, the figure that we are looking at in providing support for um, Loch Ney fishermen. For that, and, uh, he has provided already part of the, the answer to my next question. My follow up was that full support uh, or full consideration would be given for support for both the eel fisheries and the scale, scale uh, fishing uh, industry on Loch Ney. Yes, and, and I recognise that a lot of these people um, have real love for, for going out onto that, that loch and, and fishing, and it isn't the most profitable thing in the world. Um, and, and, and they have been significantly affected as a consequence of COVID. So I trust that we will be able to offer them some support and help um, to enable them to keep their nets and their boats in, in, in reasonable shape for future years. Commissioner Ennis. Um, Minister, I have to say I find your response to Mr Allister's question uh, earlier on quite worrying. And given the significant implications for Warm Point Port, for example, in my own constituency, um, I would like to ask the Minister, can he provide an update on the preparations of our ports and our airports as EU-designated points of entry? Thank you. Well, a submission was made to um, the European Union um, by the UK Government um, on this issue. Uh, it is not something that I done, something the UK government done, and uh, they uh, have agreed a protocol um, which I don't agree with. Quite frankly, uh, it is a protocol uh, which has the potential to cost every home in Northern Ireland additional money as a consequence of putting checks on, which will have a cost to business, and those businesses will cast, pass that cost on to consumers. So it is incredibly important incredibly important that um, consumers are not impacted. And the consequence of your, your lorries, which is bringing food uh, from Britain to Northern Ireland, which we will consume, and having to go through checks and all of that there is something which has the potential uh, to actually cost uh, the people that you represent more money. Now, you might be happy to sell that to them. You might be happy to tell people it is a good idea that supermarkets and corner shops in Northern Ireland um, charge more for their goods uh, because we have put in barriers um, which are unnecessary. Um, I am not in that position. Before I call the lady for her supplementary question, can I apologise most sincerely? I suggest she would send her press statements to the Middleston Mail. I, of course, meant to say the down recorder. I apologise. Ms Ennis. And uh, Emma Sheeran's very annoyed that you, you got that mixed up. Um, uh, thank you, Minister. I, um, I, I think by your, your non-preparedness your non to give us a, a, an answer to the question I asked, um, and in your previous responses today, you said you're also opposed to infrastructure at our seaport. So are you now signalling your intention to put a, te a temporary stop um, to the SPS uh, point of entry uh, controls. Um, and I think the Minister has to agree with me that uh, you know, any temporary stop um, on the work of his department on SPS points of entry controls, which are, let us remind ourselves, an obligation to fulfil the protocol, would be detri detrimental and in conflict with the Executive's position on this matter. Uh, in terms of uh, that went to European Union, was a decision that was made by DEFRA. 
so we'll, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see um, how, how things are taken forward. Uh, but I can assure the member uh, that I am not one who wants to create any barriers. Um, and I'm not looking barriers to be created between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic either, for that matter. But I'm not one who's looking for barriers uh, uh, to be put around Northern Ireland. I'm looking for as free as access to our markets and as free as access uh, to people who are bringing goods in that is necessary for us uh, as possible. Mr. Alex Easton. Deputy Speaker, could I ask the Minister for an update on his pledge for 18 million trees to be planted across Northern Ireland over the, last, over the next 10 years? Well, considerable work has already been done uh, on this issue, and uh, I welcome uh, the work within my department um, and the, uh, the, the staff who have been focusing on this issue. So there is absolute commitment uh, to ensure that we take this forward. Uh, we have also been in contact with the, the Queen's Canopy um, uh, uh, as we would look uh, to develop uh, through that programme and receive support from that programme. And we will be looking to uh, draw down funding from as many places as possible. We will also be looking to ensure that we will use as much of the public estate as possible uh, and get as much buy-in um, from people who own private land as well in terms of planting more trees and encouraging uh, that development. Mr Easton, for a supplementary. Uh, could I thank the Minister for his answer so far? Um, would the Minister consider broadening out the, the scheme to include forests that have been culled due to the ash dieback disease? Um, in some senses, that does not replace uh, what, what we have uh, taken. To, you know, that, that is merely a replacement for, for, for what has been lost, and we are actually looking for um, new trees to be planted. Um, I recognise the difficulty of ash die dieback. Um, I think it is a slightly separate issue um, if we were to identify support for it. Um, but I do recognise that um, ash dieback has the potential to ruin a population of trees uh, that has existed for centuries, um, not just in, 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 in Northern Ireland or Ireland, but right across the United Kingdom. Um, and therefore, it is something which causes me a lot of concern, uh, but we do need to move forward and uh, plant as many trees as we possibly can in the appropriate places and the appropriate trees, and we do need to seek to continue um, to identify a, a means of counteracting ash dieback, which is having terrible consequences. Mr Pat Catney. Thank you very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And, uh, Minister, I was wondering, just in my travels and staying at home, as best we possibly could in Gilead. We're speaking to a lot of fishermen. I know they spin big yarns. And I was wondering, do you have evidence? What they were saying to me was that this, the salmon seemed to be increased again, coming back into the rivers. Is there any evidence to that? Some have actually told me that it was like 40 years ago, and they put it down to the lack of uh, commercial fishing out in the Atlantic. Well. As a department, we have been seeking to stop net fishing for many years, and most of that is now done away with. Um, so, the people who put the nets at the mouths of our rivers um, no longer do that, and that's something which is positive um, because it allows more salmon to get back into our rivers. Uh, it's a hugely complex issue. Um, ch changes in water temperatures, climate change, and all of that there. Uh, is something which has um, been blamed for a lot of the issues um, around the lack of salmon. We know that our, our waterways in general um, are, are a lot cleaner than they would have been uh, 20 years ago, and it is something that we need to continue to work on to ensure that we have the, the, the clean water systems, the appropriate spawning grounds, no netting, and we do the appropriate things. Uh, to ensure that we reduce um, carbon emissions across all the land. Mr. Canley. And, uh, Minister, just slightly off the point that I made, but uh, we had heard about the 2,000 pigs that had been killed on a farm, and uh, I'm sure, like yourself, I would like to thank the Northern Ireland uh, Fire Service for what they came across and the animal welfare uh, rescue teams. 
absolutely. Um, I think it's it's horrific. Um, it's horrific, first of all, for the animals. It'll be horrific for the, the owner of the property. And I know that uh, representatives from that area have been in touch with myself. And uh, as I indicated, um, our veterinary service will uh, be working appropriately uh, to provide the support that they can for uh, that particular place. Mr. Thomas Buchanan. Ask the Minister for an update on the Farm Business Improvement Scheme. The Farm Business Improvement Scheme is uh, something which we wish to take forward, and uh, that has been something which has been held back as a consequence um, of uh, some of the decisions that have been coming uh, from the FDA. Uh, so I, I have given um, some instruction to SES who, that, that they would stay with the 1% uh, whilst we do a course of work. Uh, which will ensure that ammonia across Northern Ireland will, will be reduced and reduced significantly. And consequently, um, we can have um, a farm business scheme which will allow growth and at the same time ensure that the environment is protected. Mr. Buchanan. Uh, thank you, Minister. But uh, have you any plans for, for the trenches of Tier 1? Yes, we, we intend to announce further chances as a farm business Im improvement scheme, and uh, that, uh, th th that is a course of work um, that we will continue to do and, and make those announcements, um, hopefully in the not too distant future. Um, I did need to uh, deal with some of the issues so that people um, would actually get the planning permission uh, to carry out uh, the, 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 the developments that they are proposing. Uh, but we do need to recognise that these developments will ensure that people are able to stay in the countryside, they will ensure more jobs in the countryside, they will ensure that there is more support for local towns and villages and the shops and the businesses that are in those villages, and more employment opportunities for the young people who are brought up in rural areas. Mr. Morris Bradley. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, the Minister spoke earlier about the importance of vets during the COVID-19 outbreak. Would he support a business case demonstrating the need for a veterinary school in Northern Ireland? Uh, yes, I would, um, particularly on the basis that uh, a lot of our young people are having to go outside of the UK um, to study for veterinary. And in our veterinary practices, many people who are, 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 are coming from outside of Northern Ireland and, and um, from outside of the United Kingdom and Ireland, for that matter, um, to serve in those practices. So it was quite common to have vets from many parts of Europe, for example, um, working here in Northern Ireland. And I don't have any issue with those people working in Northern Ireland, by the way, but I do think it's much more sustainable going forward um, for us uh, to have vets who, who have been trained at home and who have stayed here and will carry out the, 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 the work here. So I, I'm very supportive. I think the agricultural industry needs it. We need that professionalism. We need that skill base. Um, we, need those, um, we need a facility like that even for quality of research uh, to happen. So I, I'm very supportive of that. Mr Bradley. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Having uh, already mentioned this at a DERA committee meeting uh, not that long ago, and also at a recent meeting uh, with the New Ulster University VC Professor Paul Bartholomew, uh, it is my view this needs to be explored in conjunction uh, with the Department of the Economy. Initial proposals made at Korean Campus uh, as a possible site. I would be keen to progress this proposal to a reality. I am perfectly happy to, to support such a proposal if that comes forward from the Department for Economy. Um, you know, coal rain is an entirely logical site. I know it has been talked about for some time. I know that there has been also talking uh, certainly some time back of, of private sector support. And you know, we do have um, significant interests um, both in, in production and um, and indeed, from the agricultural side, in having such a facility, and having that um, quality of training uh, existing, I think it would be a major boost for the, for the University of Ulster uh, to have such, um, and that would really help uh, to move things forward, even at the Coleraine campus. 
Mr. Buckley, 10 second question. The Minister will get a 10 second answer. Can I ask, is the Minister and his department fully aware of the ongoing legal case surrounding the ownership of scale fishing rights in Loch Ness and its potential implications surrounding, particularly, the proposed new permit system, which would take responsibility away from his department and into the ownership of a, one particular cooperative? I, I am, and these things being legal matters will be tricky, and uh, I will want to have full assurances on those matters and that we are fully compliant uh, with the law and how we conduct ourselves. Thank you. That concludes question time to the Minister for Environment, Agriculture and Rural Affairs. If members will take their ease for uh, a minute or so. We'll allow people to get in and out of the chamber and officials, etc. So just about one minute.